Hello everyone, this is RaySpace and welcome back to Realism Overhaul Sandbox and Kerbal Space Program 1.12 where I decide to launch the Blue Moon Lander, the version 2 Blue Moon Lander, over to the moon on a New Glenn rocket. Previously, I had tested the Blue Moon Lander by cheating it into orbit around the moon, but here we're going to launch it over there, uh, showing that New Glenn can launch it, and then also send a refueler over. Uh, I'm only going to send one refueler and see how much of it it can refuel and then we'll find out how many refueling missions will be necessary to top it off. So here I am launching out of Cape Canaveral with the New Glenn and we are going to reserve fuel in the first stage for its eventual landing on the drone ship. And so here it throws down, we save about 18 seconds worth of fuel, uh, which should be about 10%. So that's plenty for drone ship landing. Uh, I had problems with the fairings, and that turned out to be because of persistent thrust. I thought persistent thrust would be a, a little bit safe for the fairings, at least for the fairings, but it turns out not so much. I had other problems with persistent thrust with the BE-7s, but we'll talk about that in a minute as I deorbit the second stage, uh, just to make sure it's disposed of. So there we go. And it is 45 tons to low Earth orbit. The way I made it work is by underfueling the Blue Moon Lander. Uh, if it's fully fueled, New Glenn can't launch it when it is recovering the first stage. And as far as I know, they will always try to recover the first stage. So I underfueled it, and that gives it enough delta V to transfer to the moon and capture around the moon. Uh, but I was having trouble with these B7 engines from ESA Quest's mod with persistent thrust. It's Persistent thrust's fault, I'm sure. You can see I turn it off, and then when I ignite them, they work. Basically, they would seem to ignite, but then not do anything. But when I turned off the persistent thrust, when I ignited them, they did do something. But of course, they had worked earlier. I don't know why it suddenly had a... I don't understand. So anyway, that's just a separate thing. Uh, but... Having sent it over to the moon, we need to send over refueler because the transfer to the moon and capture around the moon will take basically all of its fuel and we need fuel for landing. So the intended refueler is supposed to be developed by Lockheed but using three BE-7 engines as well, so using the engines from Blue Origin. I decided to try to use the tanks from the Blue Moon Lander as the basis for this refueler but that's not necessarily the most efficient thing to do because the tanks have a lot of insulation on them and are probably heavier than a pure refueler would be. Also, the instrument unit at the top is probably a little bit heavier than it needs to be because it is an instrument unit for landing on the moon, which is a lot more complicated than just transferring and capturing around the moon. And well, docking and all that business is a little bit complicated. It depends on who's in charge of the docking, the lander or the vessel coming in. But still, landing on the moon is generally much more difficult. So, and uh, requires a lot more equipment like radar altimetry and stuff like that. So this is not the most efficient refueler, I think, because it needs the extra insulation. Any refueler would need some insulation to make it over to the moon with the hydrogen and oxygen, but this needs enough insulation to keep the hydrogen happy without too much boil off on the surface of the moon for at least a month, uh, possibly longer than that. So we uh, have a heavier sort of refueler and I still had problems with the B7s. I hadn't figured out at this point that it was persistent thrust necessarily or whether it was the engines. I would do another test to make sure of that, uh, but it's sort of random. I didn't even toggle persistent thrust and then suddenly they worked. So anyway, uh, I did a mid-course correction here, just a very mild one to make sure that we were in the same sort of state as the lander. And then I had to jump back to the lander to capture it around the moon. We hadn't done that yet. So here it is capturing. Of course, the Kerbals have not arrived here yet. And here I'm having the same problem with the engines. So the issue is it's seeming to ignite without producing any thrust or consuming any of the propellant. And it does consume the ignitions. So it consumes an ignition, but it doesn't consume propellant or provide thrust or delta V. Uh, going back to the tracking station and coming back to it didn't work. You can see persistent thrust is off. What I do is I actually turn it back on and then it works. So it's like it's not saving the state. Now, 
To be clear, Persistent Thrust has not been updated in a long time. This version, I think, for four years. So it's not really for 1.12. Still, for this install, I need to be able to use ion engines, and it's one of the solutions to allow you to do the long ion engine burns. So I need some way of doing that. Probably I'll default back to KSP Interstellar's plugin. Maybe that'll work. I don't know if it works in 1.12. Previously, that's what I used to do the long ion engine burns in, for instance, the Solar System Tourism series. Anyway, I wasn't satisfied with the performance that we got with the previous refueler, the one that is made out of the Blue Moon's tanks, uh, because again, I think it's too heavy, and so I decided to make a procedural parts refueler uh, so that we can deliver more fuel at one go, and it'll be a little bit more optimal. I, took, I used the aluminum copper tanks, I decided to use solar panels because I thought that the solar panels would be lighter actually than the fuel cells overall, uh, considering the power requirements that we have in this case. It's not a crude vessel uh, that requires that much power. And I didn't have hydrogen oxygen RCS thrusters, so I have hypergolic RCS, which is fine. That means that when we get there, we can just dump all of the hydrogen and oxygen into the lander without having to worry about saving some for deorbiting the refueler, we can just use the RCS system to deorbit at that point because it's hypergolic and uses different propellants. So here I'm launching from the Cape with New Glenn, of course. So again, a 45 ton limit for low Earth orbit and the refueler is sized for that. And we're gonna see how many of these kinds of refuelers launching on New Glenn it would take to refuel the Blue Moon lander. And here, We've got the ignition of the upper stage, again saving the fuel in the first stage. And But there's vapor and feed lines, I still have the fairing issue. And it, removing persistent thrust solved that fairing issue, so yeah, that's how it is. And I get to orbit with just barely enough, and to deorbit the second stage, probably it would require the second stage of this RCS propellant to really deorbit it convincingly, but I do give it a go and that's technically a periapsis in the atmosphere I think it should be lower than that for safety's sake but anyway we disposed of that and I proceeded to do the translunar injection burn with the three BE7s you can see this is starting off at this point with a lot more delta V than the other version it's in theory legitimate tanks because I use the procedural tanks uh, if somebody has problems with procedural tanks take it up with them but this is probably the best that we can expect out of such a refueler. I don't think that they're going to make it much more efficient than this. So depending on how much propellant we actually deliver, that'll be like the minimum number of refueling missions it would take to give fuel to the lander. So I capture, I adjust the inclination to match with the target. So there's this correction burn. And NASA could do this a little bit more efficiently and we're getting into low lunar orbit here and that's important of course the real mission would go to the lunar gateway but we can adjust for that as far as the delta v requirements and so that's not a problem like i know how much delta v it takes to go from lunar gateway down to low lunar orbit so that's not a big deal all right so approaching the lander we are carrying about one third of the lander's capacity right now as we approach and so it would take three refueling missions altogether to top off the lander completely. However, the lander has quite a lot of Delta V. So one refueling mission is good enough to just land it from low lunar orbit if it doesn't have to lift off again. Let's say it's a cargo mission of some kind carrying about the load of that crew module. Uh, but if it wants to land and then lift off again to low lunar orbit, it would take two refueling missions. And then if it has to go all the way from Lunar Gateway down and then go back to Lunar Gateway, that's three with this kind of refueler, uh, assuming that it is as efficient as this is. And you can see that the lander right now has about 2,800 meters per second in it, which would be enough for a decent landing with plenty of margin. I normally go for 2,600. In fact, it could potentially go directly from Lunar Gateway down to the surface with 2,800 they're really efficient about it, but I expect that NASA would want better margins. So theoretically, maybe it could get away with two and a bit refueling missions, but I think we're looking at three. So that's the situation. If all the stuff is launched on New Glenn, 
how many missions it would take to land that thing on the surface of the moon and make sure it's able to get back off of the surface of the moon again. And there you have it. So thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.